You know, we are so happy to have uh, what, who, you know, we hope that by the time they leave, they'll be our dear friends, uh, Lake Street Dive here on the bridge today. Uh, we actually tried to get you in when you came through town a few months ago, played knuckleheads, but schedules didn't work out. Got you this time. Thanks for coming in. Oh, thank you for having us. We were probably just eating barbecue. That was probably the only reason why we didn't come in. <laughs> well, that's as good a reason <laughs> oh, as any. <laughs> uh, you're in Kansas City. We will never deny you the barbecue. <laughs> uh, and, of course, the show tonight at the Uptown Theater, Aoife O'Donovan is opening up, and she's really great, too. So mm -hmm. that's everybody needs to get there on time. Congratulations on Side Pony. Really spectacular piece of work. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the, the thing that um, really floored me, like I'd listened to the music and then I started reading about it, and uh, you all sort of knew you'd had success on the last record, and so decided it was time to look for a producer, and you settled on, like, my favorite guy right now, Dave Cobb. Uh, that's really an unusual choice. He did the last couple of Jason Ispel records, but it was really the Sturgill Simpson stuff that got you all. Yeah, yeah. He, it was... Um you know, I get he probably wouldn't even want to be pegged as like a just a country or Americana producer. He because when we first talked to him on the phone, he was you know obsessing over all the same music that we listen to. You know, so and that that was one of the things that sold us on him. But um, it was he that album Meta Modern Sounds is just so good. We had to talk to him. <laughs> yeah, and and interestingly, he sort of took you back to your roots in a way because when you. You know, you've obviously played out live a lot, but when you went into the studio, everything was like tracking individual instruments. He got you all together and had you play in a group, which was a big change. Yeah, it was a huge change. Um, yeah, to be all in the room with each other, um, you have to play completely differently than we have in any setting. Uh, you know, on stage, we have, a, you know, a big setup with in-ears and amps and all this stuff you have to change your dynamics like so drastically when you're all playing in a room together and you want to get a good nice recorded sound um so it was a really good challenge for us and it, but it also works really fast too you, you guys went in a couple different sessions and after the first uh session of a couple of weeks you had a whole lot of stuff tracked and so when you came back it sort of opened things up for a little bit of experimentation that's right. Yeah, we could have been basically done after that first session, um, but we had already booked the studio time. So uh, uh, <laughs> we decided to just go back anyway and see what would happen. Um, and what happened was pretty bizarre. Um, uh, he had us do a, a, a more collaborative writing than, than we're accustomed to. You know, we, we generally start a song as, as you know, an individual, you know, see it through to its end and then bring it to the band and say, okay, what can we make of this? Um, but Dave was having us... Um, you know, just have uh, just start with a kernel of an idea, or um, you know, uh, an, an unfinished song, um, and in in one instance, just uh, working from a sample that we had lifted off of a of, of a record, um, and build songs that way, which was very inspiring. But obviously, we, it, we worked on a very different um, timetable, so so we produced only you know a small handful of songs in that second session, which was equally as long as the first one. Um, but it has also um, um, inspired us to, to continue to think that way. And so we are, are, are writing a lot more collaboratively with our you know, eyes forward to the next record that we end up putting out. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because I know that all four of you are fans of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And they did you know, a lot of that sort of, you know, Paul's got the, the verse, John's got the chorus, or vice versa, and sort of stitching songs together. So, you know, you're you're following in a long tradition. Yeah, we were talking about how their the trajectory of their career and the way they collaborated kind of moved from lots of collaboration towards like working very separately. In some instances, like going to the studio alone. You know, the rest of the band isn't even there, and just making a track. Um, that then came out as the Beatles, and we said, what if our trajectory could be the opposite, where we started <laughs> out, you know, writing all separately, and then eventually move towards this thing where we can really work more closely together and kind of take advantage of our relative strengths. Yeah, and you know, it's sort of like there's so much to admire, and there's so much to to sort of try and... and you know, be inspired by in the Beatles, but to avoid the acrimony at the end. What we're hoping, <laughs> you to know, do, is, is a key. I think. I think what we're hoping to do is is ultimately a few years down the road play exclusively for Screaming Girls, and then we're going to move to Great Britain. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I, I want to go back to, to one word that you said earlier. Uh, you mentioned record. Dave Cobb sent you out to the record store and told you to only go to the dollar bins and to, and to, to buy the craziest looking things you could find. Yeah, but he said base it purely on the artwork yeah. of the cover. <laughs> and, that's a, and, and it's a dollar or less, yeah. specifically. Yeah, so uh, Can't Stop is the song where you guys really did a lot of the collaborative work. And that one was a sample from uh, Major Lance and a song called Love Pains. I've not heard of this. Did you, were you all familiar with this at all? No, that no. was sort of part of the the challenge or the task is to we we he didn't want us to recognize the artist that we were buying um so just go pick up we were just picking up random records and we would just drop the needle for like an hour you know when we got into the studio um and that one we just heard it we were like sweet sound and part of it was that actually the record was a little messed up right it was like a little wily i was a little warped and that's what made the sample sound so cool to us which is why it stuck out you know, I, I searched that, and I was able to find that pretty quickly, but I had a harder time getting search results for Mr. Dimples. Mm -hmm. Mr. Oh, really? Dimples? <laughs> Mr. Oh, yeah, what was that? I forget what the it, song was, but it, it ended up on Side, side Pony, Pony. Off, off of a yeah. Yeah, Mr. Oh, we Dimples totally did. Oh, okay, right, right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Mr. Dimples is just actually the nickname the band has for me. I actually found... <laughs> you know not the, true. <laughs> you know the... Sure, it's true. Look at that <laughs> smile. <laughs> The thing that I just uh, that I found really troubling was like if you go on Google and search Mr. Dimples, you find a wide variety of things. Mm. Yeah, you need to beware the image. <laughs> yeah. Search. yeah, yeah, In including one. You know, this is really unfair. I shouldn't. I shouldn't say this. Is we're in a public forum, but. It was a fairly creepy looking guy that makes balloon animals. So it yeah. Was, uh, you know, he's overdressed he for by, the occasion. He goes by Mr. Dimples. Goes by Mr. He Dimples. Stopped by the studio a couple times, and he really <laughs> yeah. got things fired up for yeah. us. <laughs> That's when you go out the back door. Yeah. <laughs> well, our uh, guests are Lake Street Dive, and boy, we'd all love to hear some music if we could. Great. All right, sure. we're gonna play a song now called "God Awful Things." <laughs> You've been there before 
And that was absolutely lovely. Thank you. Lake Street Dive in our studios. And that's uh, Rachel, Bridget, Mike, and McDuck, who really rocked a kazoo on that last one, man. That was... That's the that, first time that's ever happened. I got to say, that was insanely awesome. That was wonderful. <laughs> I can say without equivocation that that is the finest kazoo solo to ever grace this studio. You know, th thank you, first of all. Um, uh, you, you know Bob Boylan? From, sure, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, he he's uh, um, he hates kazoo. <laughs> he seems like the type. Yeah, I wanted to. Uh, we did that song for a Tiny Desk concert, and uh, I desperately wanted to play a kazoo solo. And um, you know, the phrase "putting the kibosh on it" doesn't even begin to describe <laughs> um, Bob Boylan's reaction to the the possibility of a kazoo solo. I'm not harboring any resentment. You know, if if you'd like, like I can it. I can sort of step in and try and act as an intermediary to make peace here. Yeah, yeah I think that's best because I see. <laughs> well, we didn't time. use the kazoo, so peace was made. Right. right, but you know who wants who wants the four of you to have to shoulder the burden of bitterness for the rest of your lives? I well, I feel like. Do you feel vindicated? Now? Absolutely. Yes. House okay. Has been a beautiful. Thanks for making it happen. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Nothing but love here. Yeah. Nothing but love I will forever here. forever associate Kansas City with kazoos. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Speechless. So, um, so, you know, the, uh, and I think that everybody's starting to figure this out, even though I don't know that we've, all, that we've said this yet. But this is a four-piece, democratic band. All four of you are songwriters. And all four of you have um, had training. You actually met at the New England Conservatory of Music, and you were all studying jazz. That's right. Uh, you know, and you can't help but think that, you know, that that kind of training is what sort of empowers the ability to, to do what you just did in that last song with the tempo changes. And, and there are songs where there are time signature changes and all kinds of different things that you have sort of a conscious vocabulary of what you can do with a song that a lot of self-taught musicians might not be able to reach into that bag of tricks. Yeah, I think uh, we are very fortunate to have this um, background and to have spent a lot of time with great teachers, and uh, that gives us some musical power, but with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> so, you know, we try to use the, these more like... Uh, it, it heady kind of obtuse musical gestures very sparingly um, only for good and not for evil yeah you know the the funny thing is is that it's like um, sometimes you know formal training can also sort of get in the way and I think that you all have spoken often to having to have time away from that training to sort of have the space to find your own voices and, the, and your voice is a band yeah, it it has its place. It can have its place, but it's like, it's kind of a. It can be a shallow crutch. I think is the is the long and short of just relying on training or skill or, you know, technical ability. It's sort of like, you have to go back to the heart. I think you know what makes you like music in the first place. And if you're not doing that on stage, then you're you know at least it's hard to keep going. You know, one of the things that I, I really, I, I watched the, the entire thing. You, uh, you know, you, you, after you left school and went out and, you know, like you're having pretty good measure of success right now. And so the school's got to be proud of you. And they invited you back to do like a songwriting uh, seminar. And uh, I just, the whole time I'm watching it, I'm kind of thinking, was that uncomfortable for you? Because you've moved a little bit away from the training, and now you're back in. Um, was was that at all awkward? No, 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 no. I, I think that that uh, the New England Conservatory was um, um, uh, it, it was a really unique and wonderful place, and. Um, uh, uh, I'm sure that the rest of the band would agree, but I also have somewhat of a unique perspective because I didn't do a full four years there. I transferred there after two years at a, at a state uh, college. And uh, the reason that, that um, I made that move um, was because I uh, had a, a friend of a friend was, was at NEC, and I was kind of casting about for other school options, and this guy was like, hey, have you considered NEC? It's a great school. I said, well, what's so great about it? You know, thinking he was going to say the professors, the, 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 the curriculum, whatever. But uh, um, his answer was, um, if you ask any other student, mm -hmm. 
hey, do you, do you, do you want to play sometime? The answer is always yes. And I'd come from an environment where it was like, hey, you want to play? Yeah, I'm, I'm really busy this semester. Talk to me in a, in a couple months. And uh, uh, that was not ever the case at NEC. It was always like, hey, uh, uh, you have some time later? You want to play? Sure, what do you want to play? I don't know. I, I, I was thinking like we could read through some Gregorian chants together. Cool. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, uh, and so it was, you know, the, this, this, the, the environment was, um, was that of sort of like, uh, like a big old musical sandbox for a bunch of um, precocious children. Um, and, and I think that, that to see uh, alumni like us leave the, a, a jazz conservatory environment and play pop music is actually probably NEC's perfect vision of a successful group of graduates. So you were actually the one who went and asked all these other people if they wanted to come and sing Gregorian chants with you, except instead of Gregorian chants, it was like, do you want to do a CD bar band with me? Yeah, exactly. Well, we started with Gregorian chant. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's just, yeah, I don't have the bass notes that you need for that, like, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, uh, yes, we, we moved to, to pop music after a brief stint. You know, every once in a while, you know, you uh, you read something in the research, and you kind of wonder if, if in fact the uh, the research is right. But I read one place that your original thought was to do a country band. Yeah, uh, that that was. But um, uh, I think we all realized pretty quickly that um, none of us knew anything about country music, <laughs> um, nor did we have any kind of desire to be country musicians <laughs> not, not for anything yeah. against country music we love we love that music but but it wasn't you know where we uh wasn't you know, your wheelhouse exactly yeah. it's not it's not where we lived I, we, we, we it, it took a, a little while for us to realize that we all had this shared music vocabulary which was you know um british invasion and motown pop uh, you know motown soul and 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 um you know pop music of 40 years ago or whatever um and so we kind of went oh Let's do that. Yeah. You know, the thing that was really interesting to me about when you first started playing was you think about Lake Street Dive now, and it's like harmonies. That's one of the big things. Mm -hmm. You had no harmonies when you started this. Yeah, yes. it was a big it was a big addition. And, and now we're just like, oh, yeah, harmonies all the time. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, it's sort I, of in place of a piano or a keyboard or something. Yeah, yeah exactly, because we Mike didn't uh, play guitar either. There was no chordal instrument, and so it was very bare. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was kind of the the sound. And I actually, I think that sound actually still actually informs a lot of how we how we work and how we make an arrangement, which I think is something that contributes to us sounding a little bit different than other bands, but. You know, we realized that like we loved on our early records. We always like to put down keys, and like background vocals are like a perfect, um, like almost replacement of a keyboard. Um, and in fact, they're actually way more emotional and heartfelt and exciting to a listener to hear people singing together than like any other instrument. I mean, singing together is just like it's the it's the funnest. Yeah, and you, <laughs> it's also, I think it's also true that you know it's harder to do things kind of naked right with like just bare instrumentation so if it works that that way it'll work anyway mm -hmm. totally yeah well we'd love to hear another point. song if we could sure all right sorry i got distracted when you said naked oh <laughs> <laughs> this song is called how good it feels I want to tell somebody I'm having so much fun all alone I want to let somebody know How good it feels to be alone How good it feels to be alone How good it feels to be alone I'm having so much fun by myself I want the whole world to know that I don't need anybody else to roll my boat And how good it feels to have nobody to make conversation with And how good it feels to have nobody to keep 
up relations way How good it feels to be alone How good it feels to be alone How good it feels to be alone Oh, oh but I get so afraid when it's late at night Stare up at the sky Back in the light Lake Street Dive in our studios here at the Bridge and, of course, at the Uptown Theater tonight. The new album is called Side Pony. It's their first on None Such. And uh, that was just absolutely lovely. Rachel, you fell in love with Ella at the age of five years old. That's right. You, and you had a dad that it was sort of like, if you love music, he just put it right in front of you. That's that's exactly the case. Yeah, I was I was really, really fortunate to have a dad like him. Just anything I liked, anything that caught my ear, he was like, well, here's the whole collection. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's good, Dad. You know the the uh, the whole idea of of you all doing this band. It, it feels like it started out as kind of a lark, almost, right? I mean, it was like the fun thing that you did on the side, and for a while, I think it did kind of fill that role. Rachel, you had a solo career, and Bridget, you played in a bunch of Americana style bands, and I was really happy that you did that and put away. You had, you had that job for a brief period selling foam fingers at Red Sox games. <laughs> and yep. I still hold the uh, record for most foam fingers sold in a game. Really? 105. Wow. So many. Wow. <laughs> I'm dumbstruck. <laughs> That's it. That's what gets you. Yeah. And Mike and McDuck, you guys did stuff too. You were actually in a rock band together. Am I getting that right? Oh, yeah. We were in a couple, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. 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 There were so of, many bands. Yeah. yeah we, we had so many bands, just the two of us and one other guy. <laughs> it was, uh, we, we, it was so kind of a the, different band every yeah. week. So <laughs> that guy, is that like your, your, is that like Lake Street Dives Pete Best? Oh God! Whoa. <laughs> no, yeah, he was never a he was never a Lake Street diver, but uh, no, he's a good friend. He plays with Pokey Lafarge. Oh, uh, he's yeah. the drummer for Pokey. Um, good deal. Yeah. Uh, so he's got his own thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, it, there got to be a point where you said, "Okay, well, this is fun and all, but this really maybe should be the thing we're doing." I remember always feeling the importance of this band and what we were doing. Even when I was primarily doing jazz <clears throat> um, and when we all had so many other things going on that like this was the last on like our, you know, this this band wasn't getting, uh, you know, all the attention at some times, uh, just as far as a scheduling perspective. But like, I, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever told you that I this, but I always felt from the beginning, I was like, this is one of the most important things that I'm doing right now creatively. They're probably angry with you that you didn't speak up earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, just telling you now, I always knew this would work out. <laughs> You know, it's so funny. You, you know, you all have been a band for like 12 years, and we we just sort of got to know you on, you know, the the record before this, and and uh, you do all kinds of things. You play all kinds of gigs. You reach out in you know, all kinds of different ways, and it's like who knows what it is that finally triggers things. But all of a sudden, you found yourself on stage on a show that uh, was put together in New York that was celebrating the musical component of the Coen Brothers' Lewin Davis film. And it was sort of like nobody really had any idea who you all were, but the rest of the lineup was 
other sort of aspiring artists like Elvis Costello, Joan Baez, Patti Smith, the Ava Brothers, the Punch mm-hmm. Brothers, Marcus Mumford, Jack White, Gillian Welch, and Dave Rawlings. You had to look around and say, what are we doing here? It yeah. was totally weird. It was a complete, in every way. It was a complete dream. The, the, the memory I you know, took away that, was, that sticks out the most was just uh, sitting in a stairwell with Elvis Costello. Oh and he, j- he started talking about how the song Tom Dooley was what made him want to be a musician. And I was like, that's pretty cool, Elvis. (laughs) (laughs) Would you like a seltzer? (laughs) You know, like, what what do you say to him (laughs) for that? (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty hilarious. (laughs) Uh, You know, that, that was like, you know, when you put a show like that on in New York, it's like every other person in the audience can do you a solid. Mm-hmm. It was like every power hitter in the world was there. And I don't know that you all realized that. No, and thank goodness we didn't realize because yeah. it's like it was nerve wracking enough to be completely unknown and to be on a lineup like that um, playing in this really big venue in New York. I mean, we really were just like, we don't know why we're here. Um, like when we got the call to do it, we were just like, um, and so I'm just, I'm so grateful that like no one before was like, the New York Times is here, Rolling Stone is here, the New Yorker is here, the, this, the, every single label ever is here. Um, it's yeah, because we really just kind of like went on stage with the excitement of being a part of such an incredible lineup. And I think that really, you know, helped the performance be what it was. And then afterwards they were all like, Hey, and that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all going, Hey today. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, but you know, the first sort of, Hey, you got a, in a very public way was when you went on the Colbert show. Yeah. And, you know, for all of the cool, there's great videos and the funny stuff that you all did backstage is priceless. Other people can search for that and find it online. But I just thought the most touching thing was that you all caught Colbert, like, softly singing one of your songs to himself while he was eating dinner on set. Like, that had to blow your mind, right? Oh, completely. And he was eating pad thai, which we love to eat. (laughs) (laughs) It was weird. We, we were kind of, a, yeah, he was doing his thing. We were like just sitting in the dark in the audience, just like looking at him and he did, couldn't see us. And we were like, this is weird. We were like, hey, do you want a seltzer? <laughs> <laughs> we always have seltzer. Yeah. That's true. Well, this is going to be an amazing uh, show tonight at the Uptown Theater. It is Lake Street Dive. Their new album is Side Pony. I'm sure that you'll have it at the merch table tonight. Opening act is Aoife O'Donovan, and she is worth going to see, too. So do not be late. We'd love to hear another song if we could. All right. We're going to do a cover song for you now. This one's called Lola. She asked me to dance And I asked her her name And then a dark brown book She said hello Thank you. 
Like Street Dive on the bridge. That was fabulous. That was great. That was just wonderful. Thanks so much for coming in. We really Thank appreciate it. Thank you so much it. for having Thanks us. For having you, know, I, I, you know, I really have concluded the interview portion of the program, but I'm standing over there and there's one thing that just really has been bugging me. Bridget, how in the hell did you sell 105 foam fingers? <laughs> <laughs> they sell themselves, really. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, you know, seriously, um, you know, you're much too too big and powerful, but, you know, if you ever need a few extra bucks, head over to the merch table, because, you know, if you can do the foam fingers, you can sure move a lot of copies of Side Pony. I'm just telling you. <laughs> That's my true calling. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming in, and uh, I encourage everybody to go out to the Uptown Theater tonight for Lake Street Dive. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>